thanks everyone for joining uh, we, we are having we hope to have a great session today on fortress iq uh, it's a process discovery tool uh, they emphasize it's a cognitive process discovery which means that you know you use newer techniques newer emerging technologies which we'll talk about today uh, to discover processes and it's it's more than process mining we'll talk about it also today um, we have on the call uh, we have on the call jesse carlos uh, he is a director at fortis iq uh, thanks for joining jesse and he would be giving us a demo uh, on on the tool itself and then followed by a question and answer session so what we wanted to do is make the sessions very interactive very interesting earlier we used to start with slides and then you know get into demo that's when people wake up right so we said let's cut out the earlier part we'll just do a demo and then we'll take question and answers and all, most of you have submitted question and answers so we'll go over that first and then as time permits we'll open it up for some live question and answers um, so we'll all do that with Jesse as well as with Dave. Uh, Dave is a senior account executive at Fortress IQ. So we have two gentlemen on the call, and we also have Mr. Vasudevan on the call. Um, I don't know if he wants to jump in. So at any point, he's also from Fortress IQ. He may jump in and answer a few questions, maybe. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand this over to Jesse, uh, who will give us the demo. Jesse, uh, I'll have to make you a post uh, just a minute great great i'll do a sound check real quick and everyone hear me okay is it yeah. coming across London? yes i can hear you jesse awesome, awesome. great volumes okay mm -hmm. perfect you sound great <laughs> <laughs> as usual uh great uh here share uh so what are you seeing on screen uh, refined time range and if event explorer. Okay, great. Okay, I'm sharing the right screen. Well, cool. Well, great. Uh, again, uh, name's Jesse DeCarlos. Uh, I've been at Fortress IQ since uh, pretty much since we came out of stealth about a year and a half ago. Uh, and I've touched many of our customers, uh, done many different POCs across different verticals, across industry, use cases, you name it. Um, and so what I'll be doing for the next 20, 30 minutes is just kind of walking through the, the platform itself. Uh, and I'll touch a, a little bit on how our customers are utilizing it to explore their data and then drive some of the outcomes, uh, which could be anywhere from automation, re-engineering, uh, or even just understanding patterns within their data to, to see where they could drive optimization within the process. Uh, and then we'll, we'll open it up for any sort of Q and A. And I think the, you know, for, for the guys that aren't familiar with uh, the, the industry or all the terminology, because I think there's a lot of things out there that talks about process mining versus pro cognitive process discovery versus task mining. And all of that becomes very, uh, very jumbled. Uh, so, uh, I'll kind of, as I talk about the platform itself, I'll touch on some of those, uh, how you might want to look at it in context to the ecosystem and then how, how is our approach very different than the traditional process mining and, and I'll kind of go through that. And so when I, when I walk through uh, Fortress IQ, I'll really kind of center it on three different pillars. Uh, and the pillars of the platform is really about how do we collect the data at scale uh, across end users versus across systems, right? And I think that's one of the first differentiators about cognitive process discovery is that we're not looking at it from a centric, uh, system centric point of view, but really from an end user, the people that are actually executing the process point of view so that's the first pillar. The second pillar is, okay, now that we've collected a lot of data about what users are doing uh, to execute their processes, how do you then make sense of that in terms of processes or the activities that are happening in uh, components of the sub-process? If you think about like, um, like an assembly line, right? 
you do some work and that could be considered like a body of work could be considered a sub process or a component of the end to end process. So that, you know, how do you make sense of all of those? And then the final piece is around the insights. So uh, an insights to me is all around, how do you make decisions as to what to automate or what is the thing that you're trying to improve? How do you prioritize that across n number of processes that might be discovered because the value might vary greatly between one process which is highly complex but might not be executed as much versus you know those that are high frequency but high value or vice versa or any combination of the two so how do you then prioritize the work so that you're delivering the most back to the business uh, so those are like the three core pillars right so i'll just kind of jump right into it and really i'll i'll touch on how we what what we'll do in product and then what is it that you can extract out of the product and maybe utilize uh, your Power BI, Tableau, or any other insights tool as you kind of create like multi-dimensional reports across many different data sets, okay? So uh, what you're seeing, <clears throat> so uh, with that, uh, what you're seeing here is the Fortress IQ Q platform and the first area that I'm going to touch on is collecting data at scale. And uh, the way we do this is that we deploy out a sensor and think the sensor is just a marketing term for us. Think of it as an agent that sits on the desktop. Okay. So you deploy out this agent. It's a three meg file there. It's, you know, uh, can be configured to, to be uh, no configuration, silent install, can be deployed out to uh, by your, your IT department. Uh, and what we're doing is that you can deploy out this sensor across, let's say, a line of business that came to you and said, hey, we'd love for you to automate some of our processes. Here's the process that we think you need to automate. Well, that's the traditional way uh, people might come to you and then you would go through some sort of, uh, you know, interview process and so and so forth. Right. And then, and then, you know, and then you just come, come back and figure out like, well, you know what, that's not really the right process. So then you, you, you go through multiple cycles and nine out of 10 will probably get dismissed. One you, you, you end up with, and that's what you automate. So that's a lot of manual ways to kind of collect the data or you connect to a backend SAP system or Salesforce, and then you just kind of mine for logs, right? So what we don't, what we do, or we, what we don't do is we don't mine for logs. We deploy out our sensors to the end desktop and that, that, that line of business or that, that worker, <clears throat> that knowledge worker, um, we don't have to interview them. All we do is we, when, once we deploy out the sensor to those desktops, essentially we're plugging in that sensor or that agent is plugging into the video bus, right? So, all we're doing is literally observing what they're doing in system as they go through their process. So the value there is that you can deploy out a number of these uh, sensors to that line of business. And usually we deploy out to a, uh, a good sample, right? We don't need, if you have 50 people doing the same work in let's say finance and accounting and payroll, we don't need to deploy out to 50 of them, but probably 10% uh, of the people will give us a good representation or coverage of the process. So we can deploy out these sensors without ever having to disrupt uh, or interview them in their process or, or get on a WebEx and record their process, right? All we're doing, all that sensor is doing is literally as they're doing their work day to day, it's capturing these screenshots and really building like a, you know, um, in time and motion study, uh, you know, to, to look at what they're doing, right? So, the, so another benefit there is that instead of just asking them what they're doing, which they might tell you what they perceive their process to be, we're literally sitting passively and looking at what 
actual work they're, they're, they are doing. So we're not, we're not in, inserting bias by asking them and we're not taking them out of the field or, or uh, taking them out of their work to then ask them the questions. We're just passively listening and we're collecting all of this data like you're seeing here where they might go through and for this example, you know, it may, and this is something we see quite often actually is that, you know, they might start with an Excel file. They open up an Excel file. They start looking at uh, whether it's an invoice or a case ID or whatever it is, they log into their system of record, which in this case is SAP. And then they start working on this, you know, this, this work object, they do a search and then they go back and forth between multiple systems. Now, if we were only tapping into log files, we would miss things like, hey, this came from an email, they downloaded it, they did some ETL and an Excel spreadsheet, and then they worked uh, in their system of record. Process mining is great. They can, they can track at a very granular detail in system, but most people do not work just in one system. They have to work in multiple systems. They have to open up a PDF. They have to look at an invoice. They have to get an email. They have to do, work on an Excel spreadsheet. They, they might have many of those interactions. And for you to collect that, to really look for what that process looks like, most system fail to do that. Now there's process recorders out there that you can record a particular step or set of activities, but you're not here. We're collecting data over an extended period of time that you're seeing here, right? 135,000 events over four months, not typical of what we collect. It's usually two weeks is enough, but this is giving us all the different application interactions that they're doing. And, also collecting the data for the different variations that might happen within the process, right? Now, once we collect that data, this is where the, you know, the cognitive part of the solution really comes into place, or this is one of the areas. Because what we're doing is that once we collect that, let's say that screen or that stop motion video, we're analyzing what they're doing within that particular activity or event. In this case, they clicked on this particular file, right? So here we're OCRing and parsing out all the elements that is relevant for this particular event. And then we're converting that into structured data that you see here on the left, right? We're saying this is that they, they selected the master data, they're in Explorer, uh, you know, here's the timestamp, uh, and there's a lot of different other things that we we collect. Everything from the control type: did they use a mouse click, or did they, they or did they do control V, control C, all of that stuff. And then we're creating this, recreating this event log, right? And this is so. And this is across all the different people that might be participating in this particular process. So, again, we we deployed it out to many systems. We're collecting over a broad time frame, so that we're capturing all the interactions and the variations across their process. And when you look at the amount of data that we're capturing, if you were to try to do this manually, couldn't do it across, you might be able to do it, well, maybe one, two, three people, maybe, right? But to then go weed through and hunt for those processes across this big data set is near impossible. With our customers, when we deploy out 10 sensors over a two week period, we're literally capturing you know, many gigabytes of data, uh, you know, millions of records, right? And for someone to parse through that is near impossible. And so, <clears throat> so, this is, so that's the data collection at scale. Now, since we've collected all of this data and we have total recall of the information, we have not only people coverage, but process coverage, right? And then this is where we're now going to apply, you know, we did computer vision, OCR, NLP to, re, to create this structure. 
now we're going to then mine for that data. This is process, uh, well, not process mining, it's data mining uh, and looking for patterns. And this is where we're using deep learning, machine learning, AI algorithms to, to look for patterns across those individuals and patterns equal processes or sub processes, right? So, so now uh, this is where we take that, you know, 10, five, 10 people, millions of records, and our algorithm then looks for those repeatable patterns, right? And this is what you're seeing here in the process explorer is that this, uh, and I've already kind of highlighted some of the areas and I'll drill into it. So it's kind of uh, a little hard to see right now, but the patterns that we see over, let's say that time period will then show us, you know, what are the activities and how are they grouped and clustered together? So here we're seeing everything from they're logging into SAP, they're entering their password, and then they're going through and executing different parts and components of that end to end process. So let's say this one's a quote to cash, right? They might be going into an SAP system. They might be creating an organization or a new account or a client. And they might go through a series of steps. And then, you know, during the day, they might then go into, you know, receiving a, you know, receiving a purchase order or uh, displaying a document to verify and validate the, uh, you know, the invoice or something like that. So now we're, we're seeing uh, components of that, right? And our algor algorithm literally just, uh, you know, took those across those individuals and then really built a consensus flow saying that these are the, the sequence of steps that they are doing to execute this particular process. And, and we're also, another benefit that we're also doing here is that they might get an email or here, they're, you know, during, you know, halfway through their, uh, their purchase order creation process, they might be participating on a Zoom meeting like this one, right? And so they, they, they're, they're not just doing and executing a single series of steps, they're, they're doing other work. But our algorithms are smart enough to then know what are the groupings and clustering of these activities and then uh, uh, pairing out the noise out of the process. Meaning our algorithms are smart enough to say, you know, hey, he received an email, sent out a Slack, joined a Zoom. We know that over time, and because we're looking over multiple people over time, we can then discern what are the sequence of uh, steps that are related to each other and what's considered noise. And then we pair out the noise, right? So, so again, so from a business analyst standpoint, what we're doing is that not only did we automate the collection of the data, but weeding through the data and looking for patterns, we're helping you do that. We're doing that for you, right? And so we can discover the what in the process. What are they doing? The, val the high value work that the BAs, you know, so we take, we've taken that repetitive, you know, low value task of collecting data and kind of looking for patterns. And we surface that up here so that now the BAs, what they can do that's extremely high value is to add context to the processes that we discover. So this is what you're seeing in the groupings here is that we don't understand the why because it changes from business to business. Uh, one, one company's receiving a purchase order or processing or creating an invoice might be very different than the next person. Part of their invoice process could include Excel spreadsheet or Outlook or something else, right? And so we can't just say like, this is the received purchase order, but the BA can then now start to look at the process and say, oh, these are the related screenshots and activities that are happening. This is actually uh, the received purchase order process, right? And then we're giving you context to, you know, the, you know, the, the time 
people and the frequency in which they're spending, you know, their time in any one of these uh, steps or uh, in any of these paths, if you will. So here I can tell that I'm in the receive purchase order path. This is, you know, it happened four times and the average frequency or average duration was two minutes and 20 seconds. Well, great. It gave me a lot of in context information. I can tell what, you know, some of the things that they did, but what is it that is that, should that be the thing that I automate out of the 10 paths, right? So now we're moving towards like, how do I make a decision as to what makes sense to automate, right? And so now I can start to, to then look for like, let's say, I can slice and well, what took up, you know, um, what was that? Uh, 81% of the time spent, right? Well, okay, so that I'm not automating just the, the uh, you know, that process. So now I can start to slice and dice that data to then look for, oh, okay, so this is the received purchase order. And that's, you know, if I just uh, automate that process, that's probably the, you know, that's where the time people are spending the most in, like 85% of the time spent is between these two uh, processes, right? So, so that's one way to slice and dice the data. So now, how, how do I look at it from a higher level context? So let's say we do a data mining run, and then this is where I'll start to kind of look at a more holistic view. And this is an example of one I did for a customer. And I'll look at it from a full screen so that you can see it a little bit more. But now I'm moving into, okay, so you discovered these processes and we might have picked on one or two that m might look interesting, but how do I kind of prioritize that across uh, multiple processes, right? And so in this example that we did with one client, I kind of anonymized it. I look, you know, in just one mining run, in just one cycle as we call it, right, where we're doing process discovery, I discovered 63 possible candidates for this line of business. Uh, the total events uh, across those 63 processes, there was 21,000. There was 62 hours of discovered possible candidates for automation inside of a two week period for only four people, right? Because that's what I was looking at. So now I can start to then slice and dice this data very differently. I can look at it from, you know, here's a process where, you know, I can, I can tell the duration Well, this one's in seconds. That's, uh, I can, I can break it down into minutes and hours and so forth, but I can start to then filter on a given process, right? And then that'll, that'll kind of change the, uh, the view that I have. So here it's saying that there's five hours or six hours in this process. There's, you know, number of minutes. I can tell uh, the, you know, the, uh, applications that were being used as well as I can tell that this was only being executed by one machine right but I can I can now start to kind of look at that data holistically and look for either outliers like number of hours spent maybe that's the thing that I focus in on as the process that I, I look for or maybe it's the high frequency because maybe that's a painful process but regardless of how you kind of want to slice and dice your data, we're going to give you the capability to kind of, uh, to utilize that this data. And this one's in Power BI, but you could easily do this in Tableau as well. But we we didn't want to lock in that, let's say that, that information and only allow you to look at it, our viewpoint, but we wanted to give you the capability to, to slice and dice. Some customers that I have, they actually create, uh, they, they actually import some of their financial information on here. So the cost of employees so that they can, they can look at it from a different dimension, which is if I automate this one particular process, how much money am I saving 
uh, from automating this particular process, oops, uh, from this particular process. And, you know, and maybe not all of that in that process needs to be automated. Maybe I, I automate certain paths of that process, which makes most sense. Right. And then I can even break it down into where are they spending, you know, if I was looking at it from this, this particular process, which was invoice creation, where was it that they were spending the most time? Oh, here it was in Excel. So they, was do, they were doing a lot of transformation inside of Excel before they went into their system of record, right? And, and so, that, so that's a little, uh, now you can start to then utilize this to, to then prioritize and look at the payback of your possible automation, right? And then there's other, other ways to kind of visualize the data as well, uh, because there's, there's not just one way to kind of look at it. This is from an automation perspective. <clears throat> I can look at it through Elastic um, so that I can look at, uh, when I was doing this data mining, you know, this, this customer came to me and said, hey, I want you to, we want you to do process discovery across these four people because they're doing the exact same job. Well, no, they were all the same part, the part of the same group. But then when I started looking at their data patterns, I could, I could immediately tell that the way that they were doing their work and the distribution of work and the applications that they were working on, that gave me a clue that they probably were doing different type of, or different uh, components of the process, but they weren't doing the exact same work. I then dug into it a little bit deeper and I did a heat map across their, their work and I could tell immediately that although they might be doing in parts of the invoice process, they were not doing the same work. And so if I tried to mine for it all in one and look for patterns that were uh, similar in all four of these guys, I could tell like I, they would have the same patterns for certain things, but not related to the work that was being done. And so that gave me some clues as to how to actually uh, become surgical in the data mining, as well as I could also tell over time that they were doing different work at different times and different days. And so, again, this gave, gave us a lot of different insights and I could even do free form searches against the data to say like, even if I deployed out, um, uh, a new app, let's say, across this line of business, and they were complaining about it. So it could be used for, for re-engineering or any number of different outcomes. Here I just said, like, who's experiencing the most errors? Oh, where are they experiencing the most errors? Like, there's, there's a ton of different things that you could do with the data that we capture because this is new data that's never been available before. So, so that's basically... Uh, that's a high level of some of the capabilities that we provide. And, you know, and then the primary, you know, some of the primary outputs is not, not only are we sharing, showing you their processes, but we can also give you um, uh, automated PDDs with that as well on top of the dashboards that we, we, uh, we provide for you. Uh, any of the processes that we discovered once you kind of annotate, you know, and label the, the different groupings, uh, the PDD generation is then automated by the system. So it's all system generated and it gives you a level five PDD. So basically that's, that's the, the product walkthrough. I kind of showed you guys how we collected the data at scale what we then do with that data, how do we then mine for that data to give you insights into the different processes? Uh, and then how do you then uh, prioritize, select, make better data-driven decisions as to what to automate to deliver the highest value back to the business? So, um, cool. hey, Jesse. <clears throat> so can you also show the PDD? Uh, people are asking. Uh, sure, sure. Let me go grab... Uh, Uh, 
uh, will download this uh, order to cash. Let me open it up. Oh, sorry. Not that. Okay, uh, brought up to my other screen. So here's that PDD. It downloads it as a, an editable Word doc. Uh, it gives you everything from, and some of it is just very generic. This is where you could uh, insert your information to, to put in the justification, but what we do provide you are things like the high level process map of uh, what we saw in the process, the impacted systems, and then we'll give you a level five, which means we'll give you every step, every click, every event that happened within that process, and then give you the related uh, screenshot of the activity and this is really the genesis for the SDD right it gets you 70% faster to to then hand off to your developers to create their system design documents <clears throat> um, and the other thing is that you know instead of just providing them this uh, this high level map we're giving you this level so that it removes the ambiguity. So for your developers, they know exactly when, when it says, you know, they click on the logon and the button, it's showing you that as well as the field and so forth. So uh, we're, we're speeding up uh, the time, not only from the process discovery or the process assessment, but all the way to, uh, you know, giving you the, the, the work, the outputs for you, uh, for the developers to then start their work and also speed up their, their, their process. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, sure. thank you, Jesse. Can we get to the question and answers? I think. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do, let's do that. Let's jump in. Yeah. The, and there have been some questions on the chat as well. So let's try and cover all that. So I, I'll take back the, uh, Oh, okay. Let me stop share. uh, sharing. Sharing. Uh, stop? Oh, stop. There, there we go. Okay. All back to you. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for the demo. That was great. Um, I hope people saw a glimpse of the PDD. Uh, uh, but that that's all there is to it. It's it's actually generates everything together, and then you can download the PDD. Um, so <clears throat> let's get to the questions. Um, I hope people can see the screen. These are the questions from you who were submitted. So the first question, and many of the questions are usually with respect to the competition. So yeah. the first three questions, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, so the first three questions is about how this is different from the other tools. So for example, Ankur asks how this is different from Celonis or UiPath. Uh, Victor had a question on the call asking how it's different from everything. Salon is Pega, Blueworks, and all. Uh, yeah. And the third question, Jaydeep is asking how this is different from the traditional RP eventers and what's the competitive advantage? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And I think that's, uh, and I, I kind of started the conversation, and hopefully that kind of came across is that there's a lot of noise in the space, right? And we're kind of right now for good or bad we're all lumped in the same area right so there's there's concept of process mining versus task mining um so whether it's salonis uipath signabio uh timeline pi those guys are very 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 good at uh being able to collect uh log file information uh typically right and and I'll differentiate between task mining and, and uh, process mining. So the first one, uh, like the Salonis and Signavios of the world, right there, they, they started out in process mining, which is you can think of that like Splunk. I'm digging into logs, and then I'm trying to uh, mine for one transaction across all the uh, 
that system that I have access to, and I'll let you know what the bottlenecks are and where it's stopping in part of the 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 thing that they create as far as their VPN VPN model and stuff like that, right? So, so they're they're reliant a lot heavily on log files, and where we're very different is that we don't we we plug into the desktop. And so there's no integration, there's no needing to access log files. We're looking at a number of systems. And so when you deploy out our sensor, you literally can start collecting within minutes without any integrations across a number of systems because we're just parsing out the, the, the visual or the image that we see to get and then using our machine, you know, computer vision and machine learning to then classify those screens. So those those tools, uh, although they're very good, they only get a very small sliver. Well, I won't say, I won't quant quantify it by saying it's small or large. They're only seeing a component, which is the system. What they're missing is the end user perspective. Now, UiPath and Salonis both, you know, they started getting into like task mining. Well, those are, again, since we've built ours from ground up specifically to deploy sensors across many, many, many systems and then uh, aggregating all of that information together and using machine learning to discover that, those tools are more closer related to, I would say, um, uh, process recorders than anything to the scale that we're doing it. Because uh, I can tell you that we have, you know, the, the GPUs that we utilize and all of the data that we capture and how we process the data, you can't do this on-prem. And uh, there's, there's, no, there's no way, not with the gigabytes of data that we collect to, to discover, analyze, and, and classify those, those screens. So, and then, and then, you know, uh, going with that, so uh, to Victor's question, I mean, <laughs> you look at Salonis, Pega, well, so there, you know, Salonis is actually moving more towards the Pegas of the world and Appians of the world versus moving towards us, right? They want to get into that space versus really doing, you know, think of us as a data, a big giant data platform for, for processes. So, um, and then, you know, the, the, uh, the competitive advantage really for us is that we're agnostic across the different outcomes, whether it's just the RPA guys, they're built to, to really try to develop, uh, PDDs for their bots and they're going to use basically the least path of resistance. So process recording, you have to tell them to start and to stop you have to then walk, walk through the process and then stop it and then generate the PDD. Uh, what we're finding is that those things fail because they don't handle, you know, they can't handle the variations and the exceptions very well. So you, the, the burden falls on the developers and the VAs to come out with all of that stuff. And so that's why they're, so again, again, our, our, our approach is very, very different from, from, from the market. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, Tolani was asking, and I think you showed this. It 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 had uh, it. You showed reports in Kibana, I think. So she's <laughs> asking, can this integrate with Splunk or Kibana, and is it seamless? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so what I showed you was that uh, one of the things that I showed you was a Kibana platform, right? So all of our uh, our platform is. Um, uh, is uh, leveraging Elasticsearch, uh, and we're exposing that to you know, uh, like not your traditional not you know SQL data store, but you know a, a columnar data store. So, uh, and we're actually exploring uh, uh, Splunk right now. Okay, all right. Um, uh, Vignation is asking whether the process discovery tool has the ability to understand enterprise application architecture that's the uh, enterprise architecture application i don't know necessarily how to answer that <laughs> but yeah. uh 
Yeah, I mean, uh, if you're thinking about like uh, being able to, and maybe uh, he can clarify, but yeah, the fact that we, when we collect the data through our, our, uh, our sensors, right, some of the metadata that we collect uh, are things like process names, and then the, the other things that we may not glean from process names, we have uh, models, uh, application models that can classify and understand, and we, we train and classify all the different screens uh, that we see so that we can say that this is uh, application one versus application two, here's all the related screens to that. And then we're, we're then stitching together and you know clustering and grouping those different activities as they go and switch uh, from, from application to application to show the process. Okay. I'm not sure if that was what you meant, but uh, uh, just, just as Don, just to jump in there, uh, yeah, yeah. So the architecture, view, architectural view that uh, uh, Photosecy provides that our customers really like is the process-based architecture view. Okay. Uh, okay. So you know, like, as you know, Jesse mentioned before, one of the easiest uses of Photosecy is to just to deploy these sensors and see what is the application landscape um, that is in use by all these people. Right. That gives you an immediate understanding of just not all the applications that people are clicking on, but percentage of use and overall. And that's part of the initial dashboard as well. So um, yeah. using that is what uh, um, a lot of our customers do the higher level analysis of their application landscape uh, and then make decisions based on that. Yeah. So it's all built into the business view of the landscape, which is, I think, more meaningful for, uh, for a person making the decision. That, and that's very interesting demo because, uh, you know, we've had this pain of understanding what are the applications, the spaghetti of applications in the enterprise and how they're used. And, you know, when we used to do migrations, uh, we would not know whether the application is used at all or not. Uh, and then we would pull the plug and then somebody will say, you yeah, know, we were using that application. So uh, this, this is a great uh, use. Case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, a lot of the transformation initiatives that start from here. And that is why uh, I think a lot of, uh, you know, our initial uh, year, uh, and Jesse and I know this, right? PDD was our easiest sell. So if you go, mm -hmm. Dave used to be able to go show that PDD and say, I'll get a meeting like right away, right? That yeah, was our exactly. Win. Uh, but then over time, what Dave came back to us and said, guys, the PDD is awesome, but what the customer actually wants is to know how to make decisions on the PDD. Correct. And that is why we've invested the rest of the year in all this uh, infrastructure on, you know, giving you almost elastic, like almost real time querying on, on the data that's collected and then the process insights in Power BI. So whether if you want to look at a snapshot of data and just do process analysis, you can use that or you can query straight into the data and do this higher level analysis. So, um, so, that, so that's the way we progress our platform as well. So, so, thank, so thank you for the question. Perfect, yep. great, great. So let's just move a bit uh, fast. Um, yep. So um, Siddharth is asking how to start with process mining, but maybe Jesse, you can address how to start with your process discovery platform, right? Someone starting from scratch, how do they start? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the best practices for us is that um, I, I, I really like, let's say once we deploy at the sensors and I understand the cohorts of users, I use uh, the Kibana or the dashboards that I've created to just understand like, what are those high targets, right? Uh, it could be by application where people are spending their time. It could be by grouping the users together. And then uh, once I get what I call pre-mining or data exploration, uh, which can be done, you know, in minutes, like what, because we pre-built uh, the, the visualizations for that. Uh, then you then uh, simply create a data mining run, which you give it the parameters that you want to look at. The parameters are, I want to look from this day to this day and select these five users. And you can just uh, create a mining run and then it will then spit out the n number of processes that it discovered across those people over that time frame. And that time frame is the next question. <clears throat> How much time do you need to run it to get like a PDD output? 
She says, uh, Priyanka says, generally a BA takes around six months. So how much time does oh. photo psych you take? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so that's a lot. Yeah. And, and that's what we're hearing, that it takes months to, to do this. Uh, for us, what we do is we collect data for two weeks. That's typically our baseline. But if it's a high frequency process, uh, and a lot of people are doing it, then the data could be, you know, the data collection could be much shorter, like a week, right? Uh, it all depends on, you know, what you're looking at. Uh, and then for us to do, once we've collected the data and the model is trained to understand all the applications, which is during that data collection period, then uh, literally, you know, within hours, you could go, hey, I've my meaning I've explored the data, I know what group I want to attack, what time frame, uh, hit the data mining run, and that, you know, within minutes, or depending on how large the data set, it could be minutes, it could be an hour, it will then show you the results of that mining run. So from end to end, our cycles, uh, from planning the cycle to generating the PDD and the insights, it's usually a three week period. Okay. All right. The next question is about the capture process. How close is it to the actual process? And do you get it validated with a SME, a business SME? Yep. And that's part of the cycle process and our best practice is that since for one, we are 100% accurate. So we're not, because we are just cap, I mean, when I say 100% accurate in our data capture, we are 100% accurate, right? Like there is, there's no if, sends, or but. Uh, they did something on the screen. We captured it. Uh, now, uh, from there, when you do your data mining, um, uh, that's where you know the parameters and the boundaries that you put uh, within your data mining run, the results that it shows you, you then look at the results and the instances of that, the variations of the process. And this is where the BAs can then validate with these, uh, with the SMEs or the, the people that are actually doing the process. And instead of just having anecdotal information, they're literally showing them like, hey, Dave, you did these 50 steps. What were you doing within these? Is this the 50 steps that you were doing for invoice create? Yes, because we can actually see the date stamp, timestamp and we can see they're doing and so you have the tools, the data, the visualization that you go back to those subject matter experts. Okay, cool. Uh, how about the exceptions? How do you handle any exceptions which, you, which come up when you're recording the videos? Yeah, and, and that's the reason why we, we uh, uh, collect the data over a broader time frame, right? Sometimes even a week might not be enough to find all the different variations, exceptions within the process. So that's why two weeks is a good baseline. Uh, we'll actually show that as a variation in the path, right? And we'll tell you how many times that actually happened. And then you can even peel off uh, specific cases where variations are happening and you can even just look for, or exceptions, and you can even just look for uh, those exceptions if you wanted to in the, in the data mining. But at a high level, what, what, uh, what the, 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 you know, the platform does is uh, it, it shows all the exceptions. First of all is, you know, first documenting all the exceptions. So to, to, for Fortress IQ, it does not really know, uh, you know, actually know it as an exception. It just yes. knows it as an alternative flow. Right. So it'll highlight all those areas, just like it shows all the high, you know areas of automation. Uh, it'll also highlight your exception, and you can label that. There's an annotation feature, and uh, that actually makes its way into the PDD itself. That you can annotate all uh, those groups of uh, exceptions, alternates, and and you can call it happy flow plus one. All that, all that is uh, in the platform. As well. Okay. All right, and, and does the platform calculate effort savings? And if so, how is that done? Uh, yes, so you can, uh, since we have all of the data from the duration and the time spent uh, by, by employee, or you can aggregate them, and then um, you can look for, uh, let's say, what, what are those candidates, and then, um, and then that, that's one of the things that we 
go ahead okay oh okay. yeah yeah so that's how we we calculate it and then the, and the the other example that I, I said with one of our customers they even brought in like the cost of per FTE doing the process so not only was it just uh, duration or effort save, but also, uh, you know, uh, uh, cost savings. Okay. And, uh, do you have a way to prioritize this processes for automation? Uh, yes. So you can, again, that's the beauty of the, uh, of the platform and the data that we have, because, uh, you can use different, uh, KPIs or metrics or measures to then help you prioritize uh, your your automation, right? You can create hurdle rates, like, hey, I, any processes that don't uh, meet this threshold, which is, let's say, if it doesn't give us 100 hours back, I don't want to automate it because it's not, it doesn't make sense from a cost perspective, or it could be complexity of the process so how many steps how many variations or it could be you know is it structured versus unstructured or structured versus unstructured data set so all of those can be then utilized in a scorecard to say like you know this would be green yellow red for you know possible candidates right and that could vary from customer to customer okay a few questions on you know this uh, the agent running on the desktop uh, and uh, how are you addressing the privacies like uh, tulani was asking about let's say there's a skype coming up or some other app how do you address this privacy yep yep uh, so uh, so when i joined the company uh, which was, i was very very happy about um, one of the things that i noticed about the company is that we've over invested in the security aspects of the solution right uh, uh, no company of this size had as many certifications uh, that I've had you know that I've worked with right like we have uh, SOC 2 we have ISO 27 uh, or something like that 27001 we have our HIPAA compliance we're working on our GCI so those are the check boxes for us right uh, the other things is that we do, uh, you know, sensor level security. So other than in transit and at rest, uh, encryption for the data, we have things like whitelisting and blacklisting of applications. So for your example, I could say, you know what, I don't want to capture anything from Skype or I don't want to capture anything from facebook.com. So we can get down to the down to the domain and URL, not just the application level, uh, um, uh, you know, allow or deny. And then the other thing is that, let's say for PII data or PHI data, we have a masking appliance and that sits on-prem, whether it's on your cloud or on-prem, let's just say you deploy out um, uh, a Kubernetes uh, node or a VM, whatever it is, an image, right, where we will use machine learning and our algorithms to then look for specific words that are PAI and HIPAA. Let's just leave it at that highest level. And then we will mask everything before it even gets sent out to our cloud platform, which we support Azure and Google Cloud today. Okay, I think it's a good uh, segue into GDPR, uh, like three, four questions on GDPR, even on the call, there were questions on GDPR, uh, especially from Europe, you know, they, they think that's a deal breaker if it does, yeah. it's not GDPR compliant. So uh, Lars says that in public sector, it requires some data agreements. It's often not possible. So how does uh, Fortress IQ address that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we are GDPR compliant. Uh, uh, we're, we're a processor versus a collector, right? And so that's one thing. So that's how um, we're just uh, processing what, what uh, is given to us. And then the other thing is that we also have um, uh, localizations or uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, data residency. Mm -hmm. So we deploy on multiple um, uh, uh, platforms uh, cloud platforms to keep the data residency. So UK, Germany, Asia, PAC, uh, Singapore, uh, 
uh, India and so forth. Okay. All right, that's good. And Lars is also asking some light on pricing would be nice as far as possible. So are you able to throw any light? <laughs> hey, if, uh, we can leave them our information and then okay. uh, if, uh, if they want pricing information, I'm sure Dave is more than happy to engage them in that conversation. All right, all right, okay, yeah. Um, a few questions about how people can learn Fortress IQ, how they can get trained on it. Uh, maybe is there any certification? Is there a sandbox that they can use to learn the tool? Yeah, we have uh, several. I mean, so right now we have several things like we have videos that we can uh, we can show. We are building uh, as part of the uh, our go forward a certification training process uh, for it so that they can get certified on the platform. Uh, right now, I mean, at, as of this date, it's not, we don't have a, a sandbox and a trial per se, but that is very high on our list. And uh, our head of customer success and our uh, partner group, uh, we're building content for that. Damo is actually one of the prime uh, stakeholders there, so. Oh, okay, great. All right, one last question. I think maybe since you're in the Silicon Valley, are you open to partner with startups? I think Dragos is asking that. Uh, the answer, and again, Damo is the prime stakeholder. <laughs> that. And I'll just say, I'll just yeah. say uh, very much so, right? Very, very yeah. much so, guys. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we totally, uh, one thing that, that we want to understand here is that we are a startup and, you know, as we are growing, um, we also need to understand that you know, we are not like uh, approaching it like uh, UiPath and others saying that we, we, we solve the world's problems. We know what we do very well and we believe the customer needs like a combination of things to be successful in terms of outcomes. So we, we actually have partnerships with more startups than you think already in, in the works right. than big companies. Uh, the bigger companies are mainly around, in, you know, services and others. Uh, Microsoft obviously because they invested in us, but remaining is all going to be in the startup ecosystem. So yeah, if you, if you okay. want to leave, you <clears throat> Very good. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesse. So let's just open it up for any live questions. We have a couple of minutes. Does anyone have any more questions? Yeah, and I, I see there was a, a question uh, on, the, on, the, on the chat, chat. where the data resides. Mm -hmm. um, so we have two options there, right? Um, the data uh, typically resides on our cloud platform, uh, but along with our masking solution, we have data storage that can also happen on your uh, VPC or, or equivalent, right? Uh, so that you, you keep all of the raw data where, uh, and we're just reaching in processing the data, creating our event logs, and this is like the metadata level information that we're mining for uh, that lands in, in our data store. But uh, that's, and again, it's all with data residency. So um, if it's in the UK, uh, then it stays in that UK region and so forth, so. Okay, <clears throat> very good. So. Okay, one more question. Does the tool highlight steps with high complexity in the process map? <laughs> yes. I mean, so we had one uh, that I just did recently that we showed. Uh, it was a process and we actually went through and they said, hey, we want you to give us the happy path and we showed them their process. And I said that their processes were so complex and so varied, there was no happy path. And we had something like 900 steps across four people doing, you know, 15 processes or not, not 15 different uh, variations within that process. So yes, we, uh, some, and that, and I think when I did an instance view of one of their instance uh, of the process, it had uh, over 300 steps. I mean, events. Events. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's great. Simple to complex to super complex, right? You do yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> thank you, Jesse, for doing this. Uh, thank you, Demo, for joining. Thank you, Dave, for arranging all this. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining. This was great. Uh, I'll, I'll send out some resources after this call, and we'll put this recording on, on the channel as well as on the site. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye.